Hi, I'm Micah Clark with the American Family Association. I appreciate you joining us today. And uh, we have a guest today that I've known for many years through politics because he was the mayor of Marion for three terms. Wayne Siebold is our guest. You may have heard his name before, though, because he was an Olympic athlete in the 1988 Olympics in Calgary, Alberta. So I'm excited about having Wayne talking about both his interesting life as well as local government issues as well. So appreciate you joining us today, Wayne. Yeah, it's great I'm to have you to on. Yeah, thanks. Now, I, am, I was in college in 1988 in Missouri, so I missed kind of a lot of the hoopla. I remember locally, but I remember certainly those Olympics. And I've never interviewed a, a or talked to an Olympic athlete before, so I have some interesting questions about that. But before, what um, what got you and your sister interested in um, ice skating, and, and and how did you guys know that you were that good, or was it just something that kind of grew over time? Yeah, it it, it grew over time. Uh -huh. We we uh, grew up in a trailer court in Marion, Indiana, and literally behind the trailer court uh, was a roller skating rink. And, okay. And, and so you had to walk kind of through some woods in a field to get there. But, um, and so my mom would uh, take my sister and I, walk us over to the skating rink on Saturday mornings and for um, public skating. And they used to have this uh, group lesson, part of that, uh, it was part of that uh -huh. session. And and uh, so we would participate in that. And then some of the coaches said, hey, you ought to uh, get your kids into private lessons. And so, she did, and and um, and then just one thing kind of led to another. Uh, Cheryl Truman, uh, who was the daughter of the rink owners, her and a, a guy named Jack Courtney uh, competed in the uh, and won the World Roller Figure Skating Championships uh, okay. back in the '60s. And then um, when she came back from uh, Cheryl, when she came back from that one day, said, "Hey, you two ought to skate together in in pair skate." And so. We're like, oh, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> well, I noticed you're, you're, in the story I saw, your mom and dad um, sacrificed. I mean, you mentioned growing up in a trailer. They actually kind of chose that so that you guys could, could do lessons. They, they made a lot of sacrifices. For they did. We, I mean, we were very blessed that we had yeah. parents that somehow recognized we had this talent uh -huh. and, and were passionate about it. And, yeah, so um, at one point they had saved enough money to uh, purchase a, a house and— um, but then they realized if they take those dollars and put them into the uh, down payment of a house, then we wouldn't have been able to skate. And so uh, they made the decision to put those dollars into our skating wow. career, and we lived in the trailer to continue that path. And so uh, um, ABC Sports asked my dad during an up close and personal. I said, "You know, uh, you guys sacrificed a lot." And I remember him saying, "You know, well, if you choose to do it, it's not a sacrifice, right?" Uh -huh. And he said, "And some people." Uh, he goes, we might not live in a house, but we live in a home. And some people invest in real estate yep. and stocks, yep. and we cho we chose to invest in our children, right? Yep. And so, yep. um, yeah, so we were, again, we were blessed that we had parents that really put everything they had into uh, our skating career. So. Now, you started out um, at roller skating, and I'll show you how naive I am, but you went to the Olympics as ice skaters. Is that a... A big transition between ice because I can't do either. Well, I can roller skate a little bit. I've never. I don't think I can stand up on ice skates. But was that a difficult transition, or is it pretty common for ice skaters to start off with roller skating, much like people start go karts then go to race cars? Is right. It, is it a natural transition? Yeah, it, it wasn't too bad. I mean, uh, the skates weigh uh, roller skates weigh a lot uh -huh. more than ice skates, and so there was some um, some transition in how to move smoothly across the the ice as opposed to you know the the roller skates but yeah once we the the lifts and the things that we were doing on the roller skates actually became a little bit easier again uh -huh. because they were they were lighter uh -huh. so my sister was a little lighter at that point because we were doing lifts overhead and things but yeah we uh the, the hardest part was the the roller skating rink we could walk to and we either once we started figure skating we had to either drive to fort wayne or carmel okay to skate, so then that became a commute, right? And so, um, uh, so that was probably the most difficult of the transition is the commute. Right? When did you know? I mean, when was it going from being a hobby to hey, this is you're above normal, or you guys are really good at this? Was there a time were you winning things in high school, or were you? When did people start to take notice that you guys were were that good? Yeah. Well, luckily for us, what happened in 1982, the National Figure Skating Championships were actually at Market Square Arena. Oh, okay. And um, and where we were at that time in our 
in our skating career was we were on the junior level, and we won the national ch championships in Indianapolis, okay. right? And so that was like, you know, again, winning in your backyard because usually they weren't, the nationals travel all over, right? And so so that that got us a lot of publicity. And then um, then we moved from there to the what they call the championship division. And um, then we had to work our way back up. The first year we were ninth and then um, we were fourth or fifth and then we were third and then we were second. And, you know, so we just, and then we just stayed in that area. And so. 1985, we were second uh, in the championship division at the national championships, and so that's when we were. We thought, okay, if we can maintain this mm -hmm. um, level between now and 1988, we'll have a, a shot at going to the Olympic Games. So. I have this idea in my head of an Olympic athlete as someone who spends eight, ten, twelve hours doing, you know, whatever it is there all the time. How intense was the was your um, uh, workout or your, your your how much time were you spending on the ice? Was it was it every day? Was it was it a few hours a day? Was it more? I have no idea. I, I just <laughs> kind of sometimes I get the vision that that was your entire world and 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 you did that twenty four seven. What mm. was it like to be in training for a well, while? Up until up until we moved to Delaware to train because we couldn't get enough ice time in Indiana. Okay. There, there just weren't as many rinks as there are today. Um, it, it was we were. We kind of had a dual life. We had this life of figure skaters, and then as high school uh -huh. kids, right? And and my mom and dad were very um, strict in the fact that you're going to have both lives because one day you're not going to be able to skate, and you right. better have something to fall back better on, school, right? Yeah. And um and so a lot of we we were offered to move to um, Delaware to train with this Olympic coach after in 1982, okay. and um, my parents were like, nope. You know, when it's time to move to college and blah, blah, blah. My sister was a couple years behind me. So uh, you're, you're just not doing that. You know, you're going to have home life and you're going to have skating, mm -hmm. right? So then um, when my sister graduated in 84, then we moved to Delaware and trained full time. So once once we got to Delaware, uh, our schedule uh, was um, we skated from 11 till 3 in the afternoon. And then my sister and I, because of just finances, we, we went – we both had jobs, so I worked at a restaurant. She worked at uh, retail. Um, then we went to work from like four until nine or ten, and then we trained from eleven until six in the morning, and then that was our schedule. And then we uh, Saturdays we finished at six in the morning, but then we'd be back at the rink on Sunday at eleven p.m. So and that was our schedule. And then um, the university, and that was in Wilmington, Delaware. And then the University of Delaware built. Uh, a state-of-the-art facility, mm -hmm. and they were using us, uh, using us skaters as some, to do some science stuff with spinning and mm -hmm. all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And so they built this new facility. Then we went more to a normal schedule. We would start somewhere around eight thirty-nine, and then train until four or five. And that and that wasn't on the ice the whole time. I mean, we had lifting and uh, weight training and dance classes. I was wondering and, about dance yeah. classes because yeah. so much of skating seems to be. You, know, you look at oh, who was this? Scott um, Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't. You have to have some dancing ability or choreography, chore, choreography at least. Did you take classes for that as well? We did, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, it was funny because you know, when you, I, I didn't want any of my friends to know that I had to take ballet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, back in the day, I was like, yeah. yeah. So my mom would drive uh, drive me to Kokomo to Betty Hayes um, School of Dance over there. Uh -huh. And it was really funny because um, she had in this class. It was um, there were uh, football players, uh -huh. basketball players, and 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 we were all down in this basement of hers uh, learning dance, and none of us wanted our friends to know. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I thought it was interesting that not just figure skating, but you know, uh -huh. because you know, in dance, it, it really teaches you um, balance and your core sure. and all that, and so it, that helped in all forms of athletics, actually. So tell us about going from um, the, the the few weeks leading up to Calgary, I and mean, when you go go out to the Olympics, what was that like? Was was that uh, how much of that is by that point when you're a few weeks out? How much of it is is just kind of going through routine, or is it uh, is it more of a mental battle, or is it is it more of a, um, a physical challenge still then too? Yeah, physically not so much because you're you're so trained at that uh -huh. point, but. Um, Mentally is where it comes in, yeah. but we, we were really, you know, 
people probably won't be shocked by this, but sk skating is very political, right? I mean, okay. and so we knew going in to the Olympics, uh, based on our ranking in the U.S. and in the world at that time, that we were probably going to be ninth or tenth at the Olympics, okay. no matter how how well we skated, right? There was a team from tells you how long ago from East Germany. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. We knew if they showed up, we would probably be tenth, and if they didn't, we'd probably be ninth. Okay, and so so we didn't we didn't we didn't have the pressure of, hey, we got to go and, you know, we have a shot at winning a medal because uh -huh. we knew we didn't, yeah. right? And so so our journey was probably a little bit different, right? In fact, our journey was probably harder before the Olympics because um, we, my parents just flat ran out of money the year before the Olympics. And so my sister and I were actually uh, contemplating turning professional and getting out ahead of everybody uh -huh. on the professional circuit that would be coming out of the Olympics. And and then, um, so our high school uh, vice principal at the time, Marjorie Court, called my mom and dad because she had heard about this and said, hey, we want to try and do a fundraiser to help uh, do that. So uh, sh they put this fundraiser together and people in the community donated money. Um, and ultimately over time, $40,000 was raised, which paid for are skating for that year. That's how we even got to the point where. Because if you gone professional, you could not have been in the Olympics, right? Right. Back yeah. in the, now, that's totally different. But okay. back in the day, if you earned a penny, you're uh -huh. professional. Right. Right. And so, um, that got us through to um, that whole year of training. So then we went to the Olympic trials in Denver. Again, there were there were twenty four pair teams in that trial. Okay. Um, and then, but everybody kind of knew, including judges, who was going to be first and second. And then who was going to be third or fourth? And we were in that third or fourth. Okay. So the difference was if you're the two teams that they thought would, they didn't know who were going to be first or second, didn't really matter, right? Because they were going because right. the top right. three were yeah. going, right? Third or fourth, which was between my sister and I and a team from California, that meant one of us wasn't going to go to the Olympics, right? And so at the Olympic trials, that was our biggest. Uh huh. Th that Most was our stress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was stressful because <laughs> you know 15 years of work. Sure. Came down to four and a half minutes, right? Wow. Of of the you know, and so I remember um, my sister. Um, we were, we were the only teams in the uh, the only team in the world that's time doing this thing called a throw triple lutz, where you throw her uh -huh. pretty far across uh -huh. the ice, and and so our coach Ron Lennington at the time said, um, "Hey, we need a clean program. Let's just let's do a double as opposed to the triple." And my sister said, we didn't come here to get fourth place, right? We're doing the triple. And he goes, okay. So, you know, we come around and we do it and she lands and, and then just slips off her edge right at the last. Oh. And so the way the program was designed was that I could come around and pick her up pretty easily and we uh -huh. could keep moving without missing a step, right? And so I said, I go, man, one more mistake and we're not going. And she, she goes, there's not going to be any more mistakes. And we had two more throw triples in, in the program. She goes, there aren't going to be any more mistakes. I go, all right, let's go to work. And that was a conversation literally <laughs> on, on the ice. ice. <laughs> yeah. And so um, no more mistakes. And we ended up with the third, third place and got to go to the Olympic Games. And then the fourth place team never had that opportunity because of, of our ages. We knew this was our one shot. So how did things turn out at the Olympics? I should know this. but uh, No, that's yeah. yeah, that's fine. We... Uh, we were tenth, uh, skated well. Okay. We got standing uh -huh. ovation. Um, we, because of the uh, fundraisers that Marion did, and my parents living in a trailer, we got all kinds of publicity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we probably got more press than the the U.S. team who got third place uh -huh. at the Olympic Games, and um, and you know, it was it was, and we had no pressure, right? So yeah. um, it was it was. I, I tell people. We didn't realize the impact because back then we didn't have social media, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. everything was through telegrams, and and so you and we were all kind of locked into the Olympic Village, so you didn't know really what was going on in the outside world, what was building, and so um, we didn't really understand the impact of everything until probably six weeks after the Olympic Games, right? So what happens? You come back home to Marion, are you are you welcomed beyond you? Oh, it was crazy. I mean, just did you expect any of that or you just thought you'd just go home and put yeah. up your skates? And, yeah, we just yeah. thought, yeah, hey, that was fun. That was <laughs> yeah. our job. We did our job and it was a blast. And, uh, but then it, it, then our life changed. I mean, we were uh, invited all over the country uh -huh. uh, to for appearances and 
um, skating things. We did a tour. We did a couple of tours. Um, then um, in February, we got invited with the whole Olympic team to the White House, yeah. so we got to meet President Reagan. How was that? I know oh, that was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Like I, it, I always tell people, and I still even. I mean, it's thirty five, and the hair on my arm still stands. Is a we're all in this room, and and you know. The, you're all kind of a little bit full of yourself, right? Because uh-huh. you're on the Olympic team, right? So, so you you get there and you're like, oh, people are like, oh, when he walks in, I'm going to be like, hey, Ronnie, baby, blah blah blah, you know. And, and then all of a sudden, there was this the this knock at, at this door, right? But when you walked in, there were these massive doors, and they had these knockers on them. So it's like, tum, tum, and and uh, this guy steps in with uh, long like a, a tux with long tails. Uh-huh. Says, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, and you could have heard a pin drop. And everybody <laughs> lined up um, uh-huh. like they were supposed to, yep. and no one said a word. <laughs> right? There were no Ronnie babies. Yeah. There were no. It was like, it, it, you, you know, all of a sudden, you you just felt this. Um, I don't know, it, was, it was strange. You just like, here's the leader of the free world, yeah. right? I mean, well, and he was larger than life. I right. mean, he was quite. He was very presidential. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And so, so I was first in our line, and uh, so I shook his hand, uh-huh. and then he got about three or four people down. So I stepped back, and I walked all the way behind everybody, and I got to the other end of the line. And um, so he came, and, and I shook his hand again, and he, he got this look, and he looked down the line, and he gave me a wink and got, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was, it was fun. But on that day, too, there was, um, it was during the whole I run contra uh-huh, deal. So, uh-huh. um after we met with him, then we all went to the Rose Garden where he gave his speech. Okay. And, um, uh, but the whole cabinet was there because they were having these emergency uh-huh. meetings. Okay. And uh, so we got to meet George Schultz and oh, everybody yeah. else. And then during this speech, uh, we only had three medals at that Olympics as a U.S. team. And he said, you know, there weren't a lot of medals at, at the Olympics, but, mm-hmm. you know, here are the, and the people that got the medals were on stage with him. But he goes, there were some great stories that came out of the Olympics, and one of those was Wayne and Kim Siebold from Marion, Indiana. And my buddy next to me goes, the president just said your name. I go, oh, man, I just heard it. <laughs> and so, so it was were you, really were cool. Were you very political then, or history? Did you like history, or was it yeah, just... I, yeah, I liked history, but I, I had no idea yeah. about politics. Uh-huh. And, and then one of the coolest things ever, that, that, not that that wasn't cool, but um, I think that was like... In March, okay. Then, literally, get back and again tell you how long ago we get a telegram, uh, and it says uh, Nancy Reagan requests your presence at the White House for the Easter egg roll. Oh, so second so, time back. Yeah. So, so my sister goes, "Hey, did you get this telegram?" I go, "Yeah." So then I call my f- friends and like, we don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, "Hey, we'll see you at the White House here in a couple of weeks," and they're like, "We don't know what you're talking about." So Nancy Reagan, because again, because of the story about uh-huh. my parents and this, that, and the other, had invited my sister and I back to the White House for the Easter egg roll. And um, and so, but, so we get there, and then um, they take us to uh, the George Washington room. It took, took us on a tour of the uh-huh. whole White House, and then took us to the George Washington room. And there was two chairs, or there were three chairs, or two, and then one that was set up in this room. And then uh, the First Lady came in and sat down, and... She spent about 45 minutes with my sister and I. Oh, wow. Just the three of us in this room talking about our lives. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those times in your life where you're going, okay, how did we get here? Yeah, this is real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it, it was funny because my mom, who, who grew up in England uh, oh, okay. during the World War, right, when we, were, when we were growing up in the trailer, she would always, like, say, okay, you know, this is how you sit. This is how you – this is where – your fork goes this or you know this is how you mm-hmm, conduct yourself because mm-hmm. you never know you may have dinner at the white house right <laughs> and so i remember calling her and say hey listen we're not having dinner at the white house but we're going to the white house you know uh-huh. now for a second time so it just was really kind of interesting yeah, you know, yeah it was, it's yeah. history yeah, yeah it's history yeah. yeah and then um and then one of the other cool moments was we got to um uh we got invited to uh, new york city and uh to light the Christmas tree, so okay. um, we sa- we skated, and Tony Bennett and Maureen Morgan were sing- singing. Okay. And then the four of us, my sister and I, and Tony Bennett and Maureen Morgan, pushed the button to light the tree, and there were like okay. four hundred thousand people. You know, cool. so you know, it just changed our life. Like it just opened the whole world to us, right? And 
for two kids who grew up in a trailer court right, in South right. Marion. Suddenly right? you're on the world stage. Yeah, yeah. and, it, and um, we met ambassadors and, you know, went to their the ambassador's house yeah. in Hungary and in Japan and Korea and then, you know. And what was interesting is years later as mayor, I was back at the, uh, at the um, uh, ambassador's house in Korea and Japan and well, uh -huh. honestly, I've been right. here. <laughs> it's, my, it's my second time here, yeah. you know, so. Uh, it just, it just, it changed our life. I mean, it really, um, and that's what I would, I would tell people is that, um, it, you know, when you put your kids into these types of uh, sports, if you will, and it's not about, not only about winning and losing, right? It's about learning discipline, time mm -hmm. management, mm -hmm. how Character. to handle your handle and stuff. And then the networking that goes along with it and the doors that can open up in the future, right? If you keep it all in perspective. So the Lord takes you from Olympic uh, athlete, well known in the world, to the mayor of your hometown, and I don't know the gaps in between there. Was there anything in between, or what? What led you then? Was that kind of did that kind of start an interest in politics, having been there, or was it, it just something? Was something else that brought you to becoming mayor? Yeah, I, I think I think the seed was planted when we went to the White uh -huh. House, and then that conversation with Nancy Reagan, um, I think, really kind of. I didn't realize it at the time, but kind of set the seed. And then um, we went on tour uh, and skated with various ice shows for okay. nine years. We lived okay. on the road for probably 340 some weeks a year we were living in, or, or 340 days a year we were living in a hotel somewhere. Wow. Skating. And so, um, and then when that ended, your body just kind of goes, okay, enough's enough, uh -huh. right? And um, so I moved to LA and then I was uh, producing shows that, toured all over. So I spent probably seven years in LA um, doing shows for Warner Brothers and MGM and, and putting these uh, tours together. And then and then it got to the point where I, I didn't have kids, wasn't married, but I didn't want to raise kids in LA. Uh -huh. um, and so, and my parents were getting older and they had, they had sacrificed all their retirement and everything for us to have uh, that opportunity. So I wanted. To, I moved back and wanted to be able to be part of their life and help them through their well, later years. I won't years. put you on the spot, but I remember a story. Their producer, my my assistant Jeff, told me about you being in the car with Richard Marks. I don't know if you remember this, but the comment was that Richard Marks made something that some comment to somebody in the car, and you were in the car with him. Uh, and he's a, he's a pop singer. Uh, he didn't want to raise his kids in L.A. and was mm -hmm. moving to Chicago, I think, because. Right. He and his wife didn't want to raise their kids in that area. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. He was. He, it was. It was amazing because we just moved back to uh, Indiana, and I was yeah. like, ah, oh, man, I you know, I miss Los Angeles. Like the weather's perfect right, there, right? right. I mean, it, uh, I mean, it's a crazy place to live, but it, the weather's great. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, oh yeah, we're, we we did too. We 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 want to make sure that our kids can play in the yard without having to worry about right. you know, and so. Um, there, there are a lot of people that make that decision, and th and there are a lot of people who raise their kids in LA and who come sure. out just fine, right? Sure. I mean, so it, I, I think when you grow up in the Midwest, right, you like those Midwest right. values, right? right, and and an upbringing. So, um, yeah, so I moved back and I opened a restaurant uh, in downtown Marion. I was still doing some um, okay. entertainment stuff, and then um, got into real estate. And and then the mayor at that time, a, a gentleman named Ron Mowry, uh, came and said, "Hey, we'd like you to run for city council." And I said, nah, I'm not. Nah, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I don't even know a whole lot about politics. I've been traveling for a lot of years, and and so they kept asking. And then I finally said, did some research, and I said, yeah, okay, I can, I can do this. And I ran and won uh, city council at large, was the largest vote getter, and did almost no campaigning. Well, and that's so, almost like running for mayor when you're running at large. That's it, the whole city. It was the whole yeah, city, yeah. and so. I went around like for the first year, and, and I'd say, "Why'd you Why'd you guys vote for me?" Like <laughs> nobody asked me any any th about what I thought about anything. I said, uh -huh. "You all just voted for me because I was an Olympic athlete, uh -huh. right?" And I don't know if that's right. Or, you know, yeah, I, I don't. It shouldn't be that way, right? But um, and so uh, they, you know, then they quickly found out because of decisions we'd make on the council, sure. and and, and um, so. Uh, the person, the mayor that Ron Mowry that asked me to run, he lost, and then another mayor came in, and I just didn't like the way he was doing things, and I thought, I know I can do it better than that, mm -hmm. and so um, I put my name in and uh, won, <laughs> and yep. I'm like, yep. 
what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there's not, there's not, there are not a whole lot of books out there that say right. hey, how to be mayor. Right? What you want. And so, um, so what I did was I reverted back to my uh, building shows, right? Mm-hmm. So I always kind of, I, whenever we were going to start a new show, I would build, you know, put a circle on a piece of paper and then I would put my spokes in and I'd say, okay, I need a costume designer and I need a, a stage manager and mm-hmm. I need the, da, 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 and build the team, right? And then, um, so that's what I did. I drew my circle and I said, okay, here are all the departments mm-hmm. we ha- mm-hmm. that the city has and let's get good people for these departments. Why don't we have an IT department? Like, mm-hmm. that's ridiculous. So, okay, how do we build an IT department? And, the, and then, um, so the model was exactly the same. Okay. So I understood the model then it was, but it was just different, right? Instead of a stage manager, I had a street street manager, right? Instead of a, a choreographer, I had a marketing person, you know. And so, yeah. um, and then, uh, you know, I showed up at eight o'clock in the morning, and um, the phone started ringing, and we went <laughs> to work. And, and then, uh, not too long after, I, I always forget the exact, but within the first couple of months, three or four months. Um, uh, Thompson Consumer closed. Right. Okay. And uh, so people went to work, and the doors were locked. There was uh-huh. like no notice. And um, so. And what year was this? This was uh, two thousand two, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, two thousand. That's. Yeah, I'm getting yeah. old, but um, so uh, we went to eighteen point five percent unemployment. And wow. And so not only were we number one in the state in unemployment, but we we're like number three in the country. And I remember, so when you're when you're coming up through um, the Olympic movement, mm-hmm. right? The things that they they train you on, or one of them is, is media. Uh-huh. And so, you know, all of a sudden, I had this staff, and they're like, "There's a there's all the press is going to show up. There's press coming in from all over the place." I go, okay, fine. You know, uh-huh. that's right. I'm I'm not worried. Right? Yeah. I mean, I've done that. Yeah. Right? And so, um, and somewhere I pulled out of nowhere, right? Um, uh, I said, listen, we're not Thompson, Indiana, right? We're Marion, Indiana. Mm-hmm. And if Thompson consumer doesn't think our people are good enough, that's fine. We'll go find companies who do. Yeah. Right. Good answer. And then, mm-hmm. and then we just went and I started. So then I under, I, I understood that portion, right? Mm-hmm. I understood, okay, we got to market the community. We got to market our assets. We got to, we got to go get on the road and go see people because no one's looking at a map and going, Marion, Indiana mm-hmm. is where we're gonna go, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so we gotta go tell them where Marion is, why they need to be here, and, and try to incentivize them to do so. And so, um, so we, in the next 12 years was just based on building economic development. Well, we're going to talk about more of that in the second, second <laughs> show that we're doing, but I, I just appreciate your life story. Known you for a long time. We've been yeah. friends. Appreciate that. And I never really ask you much about those things, but find it interesting that how the Lord kind of directs your path. Yeah. And uh, your, the importance of your family and, and your your mom and dad sacrificing for you. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah. And then we'll we'll do another show and we'll talk about why people should care about local government. So yeah, Wayne, perfect. thanks for thanks for joining us. Yeah, appreciate thank your you. time. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a great weekend, and I hope you enjoyed this kind of biography of Wayne Siebold, who was the mayor of uh, Marion for three terms. We're going to talk next time about what is the importance of local government and his perspective as a mayor of a major town, major city in Indiana. So thank you for joining us, and have a great weekend.